Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about me first. Um, I've been a psychologist for 25 years and I've researched into intelligence, reasoning and problem solving a lot. Now there's two concepts I want to take away from this research which are useful to think about when we look at maps. The first is cognitive load. Okay, now there's people out there who think that if one piece of information is helpful, then 10 pieces of information is going to be 10 times as helpful. And that is definitely not the case. Cognitive load is the amount of information you need to think about in order to solve a task. And it's very easy to show that you raise the information up and performance can decline quite catastrophically. Okay, now the other important concept is cognitive capacity. Okay, people differ in their ability to cope with lots and lots of information. And that becomes a problem if a map designer's got high cognitive capacity because he or she might not appreciate there's other people out there who actually can't cope with the information that's being thrown at them. Okay, so let's start off with a quick history lesson. This is the map that people were carrying in their pockets in London in 1932. It's a geographical map. The designers tried to put every single twist and turn that every line does on the design. And just to highlight a couple here, you can see the way in which the lines are wandering about. That's information that you simply don't need in order to plan a journey. And therefore, this map has high cognitive load for the purpose of journey planning. So, more detail than you need. So along comes a man called Henry Beck and changes everything forever, comes up with one of the great images of the 20th century. He tries to improve the design, he changes it from all the twisting turning lines to horizontal vertical lines and 45 degree diagonals. If you just compare what you saw before with the lines now, they're all nice and straight. Okay, now whether or not this map is more usable, there's also an important message here that it's delivering to you. It's telling you about a journey by underground. It's saying to you that this journey is going to be hassle-free. It's going to be not too much effort. It's going to be easy and it's going to be quick. Now I just want you to hold that image in your heads, hold that message in your heads, and now think about the message that this map is giving you. Okay, that's my thesis for today, that something is going wrong, that today's designers are not emulating the success that Henry Beck did in early times. But in order to do that, what I need to do is just to run you through some of the features of Henry Beck's design. It was a remarkable piece of work, he had so little to go on, and yet he did such a good job of it. So let's start off with reality. This is what Henry Beck had to contend with on a snapshot of the map. And this is what he came up with. And it would have been so easy for him to have made mistakes, gone wrong, come up with designs which people wouldn't have actually taken to. He might have tried to emulate reality a little bit too closely and ended up with a design with lots of short lines, lots and lots of zigzags. That problem doesn't simplify design in any way. It just takes one type of complexity, twisting, turning lines, and turns them into a new type of complexity, zigzags instead. Nothing is simplified. The shape of the chaos has simply been recycled. We could have had lots of nice straight lines on the map, but people need to see clear shape. They need to see horizontal axes, circles, squares, rectangles. They like to see lines in parallel. If Beck had chosen a set of angles which didn't relate to each other at all, he might have, might have ended up with a design with poor coherence. And taking that to an extreme, people can find that quite disturbing to look at. Okay, there's lots of parallel lines here, but Beck chose horizontal, vertical, and 45 degree diagonals. And those um, different um, lines relate to each other quite well. So, for instance, you get perpendicular crossings, lines crossing at 90 degrees. Beck could have chosen a set of angles, a set of lines which didn't relate to each other at all, lacking sort of the aesthetic features that people like. And even with the right design rules, Beck could have had a design which was, had poor balance, parts of the design crushed up, parts of the design empty. The current official map's a bit like that. Or, in his quest for simplification, he could have distorted London too much. Beck's early map is remarkable because he actually doesn't distort the shape of London very much at all, which means that not only did he come up with a design which was simple, coherent, balanced and harmonious, it wasn't so distorted that it upset people by conflicting with their expectations of the shape of London. Okay, so let's have a think about this in terms of psychology now. So we've got before and after here. Okay, straight lines are easier to follow, but more than that, 
there's straight lines here, which be, and straight lines present less information to the user than twisted lines. So the cognitive load of using this design is reduced compared with previously. But there's more to it than that, because in the process of simplifying the design, making it coherent, Beck's design reveals the shape and structure of the network. How the components relate to each other, how they join together, the overall shape of the transport connections in London. And by making that clear, making it easy to understand, you make it easier to learn. So that what happens is that when you plan a journey, you also learn a bit about the shape of the network, which makes planning the next journey easier, which means you learn a little bit more about the network, which makes planning the next journey even easier. A good design creates a wonderful virtuous circle in which the more you use that, the more you learn, the easier it gets. OK, so let's fast forward to today and let's take the current design. Now, we want to, we're looking at the sort of trajectory the lines take, but there's a lot of extra stuff on this map as well. So let's just subtract out the extraneous details and see what we've got left. OK, now, designers are given quite a big challenge today. The current map has the same size sheet of paper as Beck's map did in 1933, but there's 100 extra stations to fit in, and something's got to give. So lines which looked nice and simple and straight before are now being bent up to fit everything in. And the new lines are not being added very um, convincingly either. OK, now, this is the point where people say to me, well, a few corners never hurt anyone. The current design isn't broke, so why bother trying to fix it? And in response to that, I say, well, it's not about being totally broken or totally easy to use. What I'm saying is the current map is breaking. There might, be, um, there might be ways of improving it. Now, the problem is if you're not an expert in map design, if you don't have a theory of effective map design and you don't have any data, it's very difficult to actually predict map usability. All you can really do is fall back on your expectations and prejudices. And so what I really need to do is emphasize the problems of too many corners on the map. And one way to do that is by parodying the current design. So taking everything that's wrong with it and then exaggerating the defects so now everyone can see that too many corners are bad. OK, so the purpose of map is to unsettle you a bit. If it's done that, it's succeeded. A few corners are a bad thing. Too many corners make a map difficult to use. Of course, we can go both ways here. So with a larger sheet of paper, we can try and improve the design as well straighten out the paths, the lines taken to the suburbs, so you can see how they relate to each other and the centre more clearly. And with three maps, we've got a nice basis for a usability study. So what we did here was we gave people pairs of stations, asked them to plan journeys from A to B. They were difficult journeys. They all needed two interchanges. And we got a nice straightforward set of findings. The many corners map was hardest to use, slowest to plan journeys. The official design was in the middle and the fewer corners design was the easiest of all. So off the shelf, we can give you a map that's 20% faster for journey planning than the official map without having design features that might upset everyone. But the point is here is that the fewer corners map still got lots of corners on it. So the next question becomes, is there anything we can do to simplify the design still further? Well, there's nothing particularly special about the angles that Beck chose, so let's see what we can do. We could try this. This is a hexalinear map. It's got three angles on it, so it's more restricted than the previous version. Um, it's got horizontal lines and 60-degree diagonals. And if you look in the center and count them, you'll see fewer corners than on any map you've seen before. So it looks as though 60-degree um, angles fit central London better than 45-degree um, angles. Not only that, for people who like geometry, there's lots of pleasing little equilateral triangles in the center to give the map some harmony. OK, so changing the angles can simplify the map. Adding to the angles can let us straighten the lines out. This map is dodecalinear. It's got horizontal and vertical lines, 30 degree um, and 60 degree diagonals. And there's even fewer corners in central London. We've got the equilateral triangle still there. And we're now back to parallel line crossing. So in theory, we've got simplicity, um, coherence, harmony. Trouble with more angles is that we're adding to the complexity of the map in other ways. We might have straight lines, but there's more different angles um, all over the place. So the aim of the designer is the simplest possible line trajectories with the fewest possible angles. 
Now we could straighten things out even more by having more angles on the map, but then you run the risk of losing visual coherence because the more different angles you get, the harder it is to keep lines parallel. And also, no matter what we do, we're still going to end up with a few corners there. So let's try another approach instead, which is just smooth all the corners away. So wherever you follow the lines, there's nothing to interrupt the flow. OK, now this map's really interesting because it really polarizes opinion. I can tell you now that half the people in the room think this map is the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. <laughs> and the other half of the people in the room think that this map is an appalling travesty. Everything that could go wrong with the map is staring them in the face. Now, the trouble is that you know, there's a dissociation between you know, opinions about maps and their actual usability. And I can promise you that in usability studies, this map is just as easy to use as the official map. So you know, just take, take your preference, straight lines or curves, whichever one you like. They're both just as easy to use. OK, so where does that take us? There's all sorts of ways we can adjust the London Underground Network. There's different design rules we can try. But in reality, we probably don't need them right now. The current network is just simple enough and the current map is just usable enough that we don't need to risk upsetting the general public with something radical. Londoners are very, very defensive. They've got very strong expectations about what a good map should look like. But Crossrail is going to change everything in four years' time, and then we might need to try alternatives. And we also need to look at the rest of the world as well. There's lots of people taking London design rules, trying to their own cities, and not coming up with the same level of success as to Henry Beck did. And that's something important we need to think about. You know, do these line rules that work for London, do they work everywhere else? OK, let's take a look at Berlin. OK, it's got a nice ring defining the centre of Berlin. But look inside the ring, and there's not very much shape there. You can't really see any sort of clear, obvious structure to the network. Now, part of the problem is you've got U2 and U7, which just can't make their minds up. They wander across the page, zigzagging away, hiding the underlying structure of the map. So we need to try something radical, try and straighten out these lines, desperately trying to give Berlin, the Berlin network, a bit of shape so people can relate to it and interpret it. So this is the sort of thing you end up with. It's a multi-linear map, any angle you like, but trying very hard to maintain coherence with parallel lines. You've got lots of straight lines going across the centre of Berlin. And finally, we've managed to tame U2 and U7 as much as is physically possible. We'd have to rebuild Berlin in order to straighten them any more than that. OK, so that's Berlin. A linear map can tame the network, can give it some shape, some coherence. Paris is a bit of a hopeless case in comparison. You're just faced with a page of zigzags marching across in front of you. And if you look at individual lines, look at line four, the busiest in Paris. That's got 16 corners from end to end. A straight line base map is not simplifying anything here. It's just taking the chaotic Paris network and presenting a new type of chaos to the user. Now, in the case of Paris, the lines are so interconnected, so twisted up, that this is probably a case where a straight line map, base map is probably not going to give you anything helpful at all. So this is one case where I suggest in all curves design is ideally suited. So what I've tried to do here is smooth out the corners, so there's harshness, there's less interruption to the flow, and also sort of stretch about Paris a little bit just to highlight the, um, highlight the ring that defines um, the centre of Paris running through the, the middle distance. OK, the interesting thing here is that when you look at this map, look at the ring, you can see it, you can see how it defines Paris, you now know a bit about the structure of the city. You can take some expectations with you. Now, even when you look at this map and try and find the ring, you still can't see it. There's so many zigzags on this map that even though you know there's some structure there, you still can't see it on the design. OK, now we've done usability tests again. We've compared this map with the all curves map in lots and lots of studies. The all curves map always wins. It's 50% faster for journey planning than the um, than the official map. And you can do some back of your envelope calculations, work out the effect of that on usability. And even as a conservative estimate, the difference is so great, and there's so many tourists in Paris, that every year, four years of person time is being wasted by bad design. But 
we still get this dissociation between people's expectations, their preference and usability. We give people, we've given us, done a study where we've given people both maps. They've had direct experience of planning journeys with both. We found that 60 out of 64 people found the all curves map easier to use than the official map. But when we said to people, what map would you rather take away with you to Paris? Only 50% of people wanted the all curves design. Okay, so where does that leave us? All around the world, there are designers who don't really appreciate what a schematic map is trying to do. They don't understand that what they're looking for is simplicity, coherence, harmony, balance, and not too much topographical distortion. And as a result, we're getting designs which are simply um, not as good as they could be. But more deep-seated than that, we've got designers who are just taking the London design rules off the shelf. You have horizontal lines, vertical lines, 45 degree diagonals. They work for London, they must be perfect. So let's just grab them and use them for our city. And the problem is, that if you're being that unthinking, then chances are you're not going to think at all for the whole design process. And a real disaster is going to result, for such as in somewhere like Madrid. The problem is that every network is different. They have different shapes, they have different connections, they have different sizes. And so the real challenge for the designer is to think about the design rules, think about how best to model the network, and then once you've done that, try and optimize so that within the design rules you've chosen, simplicity, balance, coherence, a harmony, and not too much topographical distortion. The point is, is that just because some design rules worked for Henry Beck in 1933, that doesn't mean they're the right rules for every network now and forever into the future. Okay.